Hello there, my name is Michael Altdorf. I work in the Education Outreach Department at the Library of Congress. We are thrilled to welcome you to the second annual online conference for educators. Our session today, How Did Slaves Gain Their Freedom During the Civil War? Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our presenter. Twin Tran received her PhD in history from, the, from University of California, Berkeley in 2007. Tran's field of interest are 20th century United States history and Asian American history, particularly Southeast Asian American history. As a graduate student, researcher, and teacher coach, Tran worked with the UC Berkeley History Social Science Project from 2002 to 2006. She joined the project statewide office in 2008. As an assistant director for the project, her major responsibility is the coordination and development of academic programs. Welcome and take it away. Great. Thank you everyone for being here with me. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Library of Congress and its educational outreach team for organizing this wonderful conference to connect us with one another and the library's excellent resources. I hope everyone has enjoyed the conference thus far and that you will continue to tune in tomorrow. Um, so a little something something about me and our, my, the organizations I represent. I am part of TPSU C. Davis. I'm the assistant director of the teaching with primary sources here at the University of California Davis. That's in California. Um, we specialize in disciplinary literacy and building curriculum units that feature uh, materials from the library's archives. And I am also representing as the assistant director of the California History Social Science Project. Um, before you, is a summary of our activities and programs. Um, please note that we are a statewide network. We have regional sites and satellite sites across California based out of co uh, colleges and universities across the state. We have classroom resources available at our website following the links on this slide. And all the primary sources that I'll feature as part of my presentation are also linked. So at your leisure later, you can click onto them and it will take you directly to the lesson that I'm going to feature or to its bibliographic information. So that's a little bit about our organization. OK, so, um, so that I have a sense of who's online with me today, um, who we are collectively, and the expertise in the room, I'd like to know who teaches emancipation. And for those of you that do, um, what is your main focus when you are teaching the end of slavery? All righty then. Um, so six, uh, let's see, 62% of folks teach um, emancipation. I guess um, other folks are interested in the subject. And then our second one was, uh, how, what is your main focus when you do teach a subject? So I have an information literacy instructor. Um, I also have someone who teaches primary sources uh, from the Civil War, great. Other folks teach research skills, first year writing. OK, on the subject of emancipation, it seems to me, whoa, our, what we're looking at is that majority of folks teach emancipation during the Civil War. Great. And um, I don't know if your students or anything like the students I've had, uh, most of the students I've taught uh, um, in the past have been college students, and most of them privilege uh, Lincoln uh, for emancipating the slaves, that Lincoln freed the slaves. Has this been your experience um, as well? And so I asked this question because I was surprised myself. I have a kindergartner. And in preschool, he learned about President Lincoln, which I was thrilled about because, you know, I am a history geek. Um, but they, they talked about Lincoln and that he did free the slaves. And I thought that was very interesting that that narrative started even in, in preschool um, and that, you know, people have this hero worship of Lincoln. And, and rightfully so, he did lots of wonderful things as president. Um, but, you know, privileging Lincoln um, as the one to free the slaves is only part of this national uh, myth, only part of the story, a full story of how um, the emancipation of slaves came about. I think most students and most Americans believe that slavery ended with, um, 
with the Emancipation Proclamation or the 13th Amendment, and definitely that Lincoln played a de decisive and starring role. And it seems like uh, that's what I see reflected in the comments here in the chat box. Thank you, everyone. Here, now, historians argue something quite differently. And this lesson that I'm going to feature provides students with secondary and primary sources to make these arguments as well. So, all right, so we have this national myth that Lincoln freed the slaves, and a lot of students believe it. Um, and this is sort of the narrative that's being still taught over and over again, including my uh, kindergartner. So if you can see in the passage here in writing, it sort of reflects that. Um, a little, in any words to say, what folks can see in these passage, passages here, how that understanding or this mythology of Lincoln freed the slaves repeats itself. So in this passage, what you see the student writing about is that Lincoln was the one who wanted to start to focus on the slaves by the Emancipation Proclamation. It was Lincoln that wanted all the slaves from the Confederacy to be freed and so they could join the army. So that Lincoln was the one who had this idea and originated this idea of freedom for uh, of, of those enslaved um, and that they were useful for the uh, war effort. So it's important here to note that the Emancipation Proclamation did not actually free any slaves in the Union. It only freed slaves in the Confederacy. But what did the Emancipation Proclamation actually do? It did permit black enlistment. So by the war's end, 180,000 freed and enslaved persons fought for the military. Enlistment was one key opportunity for freedom, especially those in Union territory. And then it empowered and emboldened those who were still on farms and plantations to free themselves of that bondage as soon as Union troops were anywhere in the area. So that um, slaves, um, those still enslaved, freed themselves by crossing Union lines. So this lesson um, that we built is around uh, the history blueprint. And the history blueprint, we have three now, the Civil War, the Cold War for US and world history, and Science's Encounter for the Medieval World, were created as a model of curriculum units for teachers looking for example Common Core state standards rich instruction. All our units are inquiry-based. They include activities and guidance for teaching reading, writing, listening, and speaking in the content area that is discipline specific and covers the state's content area um, content standards as well. Each curriculum unit includes multiple lessons that are each organized around a focus question. And the focus question for the lesson that I'm going to feature here, um, that's so funny. Uh, never mind my yellow bar there. My yellow bar is actually supposed to cover emancipation. Clearly that's the topic of the of the talk. Um, but the, the focus question for emancipation was how did slaves gain their freedom during the Civil War. Now in the first unit the, of the Civil War, these are the that emancipation lesson is one of eight. Uh, thank you. It, whether that was Michael or Kathy, thank you very much. Um, so the emancipation is one of eight lessons in this entire unit. And the first one is about how the slaves gained their uh, freedom. So uh, the older historiography said that re Lincoln freed the slaves. That's a problem because, as I was saying earlier, the Emancipation Proclamation really didn't free anyone, um, only those folks in the Confederacy, and they weren't part of the Union anyhow. Um, and that Lincoln like walked this really tight, light, um, tight um, line between trying to keep those border states uh, within the Union and then, but also wanting to deal a blow to the Confederacy and its ability to use slaves for manpower and for battle. Um, and so what we wanted to do was create a lesson that reflected current research and the role of slaves in their own freedom. So the focus question is how did slaves gain their freedom? Now a good uh, focus question for a lesson reflects current scholarship. It inspires wonder and curiosity. It provides a focus for student learning that's standards based. It requires students to utilize their critical thinking and writing skills. It elicits more than one answer. And as you can see in this 
uh, question that we put we pose. It helps. Um, we want students to determine for themselves how emancipation came about. It, they're supposed to generate a thesis a statement that would be supported by evidence. That evidence we provide as part of this lesson learning. So the lesson is Common Core Aligned. There are two main activities, a cause and effect reasoning, um, reading, and uh, plenty of work with primary source analysis. Um, students, taken all together, students have the opportunity to cite specific textual evidence, determine central ideas, describe how text presents information, reveals um, author's points of views, integrate visual information as evidence, and analyze relationships between primary and secondary sources. All of this stuff is Common Core and part of this lesson. And I'm not sure if Common Core is a real, real word, but I like to use it. <laughs> so um, the lesson itself has four steps, and I'm gonna focus the majority of my time on the emancipation fact-finding mission. You'll also hear me call it a gallery walk. I think most teachers are familiar with a gallery walk. You post things up on the wall, students walk around, make some observations about it. Um, we wanted to use that same concept um, with some primary sources around this idea of um, deeds and acts of slaves to free themselves. So we call it an emancipation fact-finding mission because we're trying to figure out some facts about like how to unpack and deconstruct this myth, right? About Lincoln and emancipation doing the heavy lifting of freeing the slaves. So first, uh, of the four steps is introducing the focus question. So initially, when you introduce a focus question, there are some key things that you're trying to get out of your students um, to sort of as a formative assessment. Um, you're trying to access background knowledge. You want to connect to some prior learning. And you want to determine if there's any preconceptions on the topic, like I started with earlier, whether you know um, students still privilege Lincoln and the emancipation, where are they coming to um, where are they coming from in terms of where they're, what is their starting point uh, when you're teaching them about emancipation. Now some folks might, for us, this, as I said uh, previously, this emancipation lesson is number six in um, a total of eight lessons. So previously students had some experience with emancipation proclamation because there's a focus on Lincoln's speeches. So I'm trying to fill in a little bit of the gaps here so that you can get caught up with some of the context of how we built this lesson. But in general, you do want to start a lesson with trying to access these three key points here. So the way we did it for this lesson was we have this image here in front of you. Um, it's titled President Lincoln. Uh, writing the Proclamation of Freedom, January 1st, 1863. Um, are folks familiar with this image at all? It is a painting that was painted by uh, David Blythe. I hope I said that right, B-L-Y-T-H-E. If you click it on later, it will link you to bibliographic information. Oh, so, okay, Blair uses it in the unit. I will be interested if you could share, Blair, how you use it in your unit. So what we do, what we suggest in this lesson is for teachers just to have this as a, you know, as a cold opening to see what students know about Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation. Some students will figure out that it actually was um, issued on January 1st. So this image actually is an imagination of what he looked like when he was composing it, not what he actually was doing the day of. Um, and so um, there's a handful of these sort of descriptors I have on the side, some key details that students might pick up on. And um, generally in California, the Civil War is taught at the end of the year. By now, you may not need a primary source analysis tool to uh, deconstruct this um, or analyze this primary source to your students. But just in case you may need one, um, if you click on to the scroll here at the bottom right corner, I uh, it's linked to the Library of Congress's own primary source analysis tool. Um, in general, when you're uh, analyzing a primary source for your students, you want to have them observe it, uh, make some reflections, you want them to ask some questions of it, and think about other things they might be interested in it for further investigation. That's how the Library of Congress's primary source tool is organized in those four chunks. and. Um, it's also similar to another primary source analysis tool that I will feature um, when we look at the primary sources in during the gallery walk. Um, so 
I'm reading Blair's comment about students looking at the picture and picking out items they see, yes, um, and what some of these items mean, yes. So, you know, she's trying to get a tone of what this, this first image uh, says about Lincoln, his role with emancipation, um, you know, his, his centrality in, in the creation of it, um, some things that he's concerned about, you know, whether it's a sword, the scales of justice, uh, being able to represent either James Buchanan or Andrew Jackson with their bust and also in the picture, or even the rail splitter's mole in the front of him, hearkening back to his royal, um, rural roots. Um, so some of your students will pick up on that. Um, but you at the um, but the main part of this is like you're trying to determine what their background knowledge is. Um, you're trying to connect to the prior learning and any preconceptions they ha they may have on the topic. Now remind your students of two earlier points. Um, that in, 19, in 1860, there are nearly 4 million slaves in the United States, mainly in the South, and that Lincoln's rationale for fighting the war had changed over time. So, um, so what is it about the Emancipation Proclamation that brought about this change of the purpose for fighting the war? I think it's universally known by the time of the, uh, of the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln's purpose for the war of preserving the Union changes to really uh, to end slavery. And so what we want to, students to know is like, okay, well, we're going to look at this topic and we'll look at like, why, why has Lincoln changed his mind, you know, and, um, you know, let's look at some of the resources to think about like what could have impacted uh, Lincoln's choice in that matter. So it's an early start of getting them to um, visualize and understand some of the key players and some of the um, key concepts the students will um, engage in before they start to actually look at uh, some primary sources. So the second part is to do a little bit of background reading. And this is where they look at and read very closely a secondary source for cause and effect uh, reasoning. Now, it's useful to relate to students that history tells a story of events. And these events can serve as causes for other events and effects from previous events or both. As readers of history, it is important to not only know that the events take place, but also to understand the causal relationships that link uh, events together. So this is what our reading does. So here we have multiple uh, sections for our secondary reading where students will read one section and then be able to identify cause and effects in these, in these um, um, boxes. The first one has been done for them. I'll let you have a quick read of that. And we simplified it in the beginning. The causes, um, the cause statements are bolded, so that's very easy just to like go through the bold statements, put them in one column, and then read through the uh, the passage to figure out the effects. Um, further along in the reading, uh, it's uh, the text is written in, um, not in italics anymore, and there aren't bolded, so the students have to work a little bit harder for that. So here's a sample of, of one that's not done for the students. Um, where they have to fill out the cause and the effect. And then following this, they answer some text-dependent questions. So students will need to identify the cause and effect from separate sentences, and this forces the students to slow down and make connections between causal relationships. So ultimately, this is a summation of what they get from uh, their secondary reading. A chart like this would be useful teachers to give as a whole, or teachers might maybe uh, blank out some boxes and have teacher and students fill them in. Um, any ideas? I would like to hear some ideas that some of you may have about how this could be a good summary for their secondary reading. I think ultimately the graphic organizer helps to summarize their new learning, and that the main ideas gained from this. Yep, it's a great way to summarize. And so the main ideas gained from this reading will help to provide context for the primary sources that they really dig into in the next step. What we hope is that students will learn the politics of emancipation and what is at stake politically for Lincoln, the Union, and the Confederacy. Um, that slaves learn, um, that they learn that slaves had um, forced a political situation upon uh, these actors when they left their farms and plantations before the Emancipation Proclamation was passed. So using something like this might show them more causes than effects. Is that right? Or there are more effects than causes, correct? 
And what's really nice that I've seen before is if you um, extend this even further and have a causes effects and then create a third column to the right of effects, long-term effects, so that you think about, okay, what is lingering that has, that, that what are the long-term repercussions of the Emancipation Proclamation as well. Okay, so the third part, we set them up, we primed up the students, they thought about cause and effect reasoning, um, they talked about, uh, they figured out the political ramifications and what's at stake politically for the Emancipation Proclamation, all the key holders. Um, and now we're looking at uh, the slaves themselves, um, those enslaved and free blacks and what they did to force the issue of Emancipation Proclamation upon Lincoln and Congress. So procedures for a gallery box style uh, setup. Um, as you can see in this picture, we've done this workshop multiple times with teachers, in fact, as a way to just do a simulation of how it would work. Um, but generally, you just want to have a nice large size of the primary sources. We've had 10 for this gallery walk, this fact-finding mission. Uh, we spread it out across the room. You can set up the students in pairs or small groups, depending on how your class is behaving um, and what works for you. Um, and while students work together in groups, each of them have their own fact-finding mission guide notes. So each of them have note-taking guide for every single item. Now, 10 is a lot. Um, you know, it's completely up to teachers how many they want to do. Um, we could have a conversation about what would be the best for your timing. Um, I picked my favorite as uh, in a little bit of... Uh, down the road, we're going to actually process one of these together. Um, I feel like that one would be like a key one that you could spend tons and tons of time on. And um, But there's a variety, 10 and all, that you could sort from and, and, and look through to work with your own students. Okay, so how long will this step uh, allow for this step? Um, I would say a whole class period just to do the gallery walk. If you want to do all primary sources, um, in one class. If not, then I would say anywhere between five minutes. I would say five. This is this is my assumption that um, this is for us in eighth grade. So Civil War is taught at the end of the eighth grade. So by then, students have had lots of experience um, analyzing primary sources. I hope, um, and so they're going to be pretty quick at it. Um, so I'm thinking anywhere between, like, no more than five, six, seven minutes per source, and then, um, you know, so, you know, you could get away with three or four um, in a class, and you could assign some for homework. It's completely up to, uh, completely up to you. Um, and you see that some of, something like this doesn't have that much text. Um, although I did provide the bibliographic information for this one because the bibliographic information was so good because it gave so much context to the image itself. And you can you too can decide whether you would provide that or not. I did it just because there were ten, and I didn't want them like searching for research information that difficult. Um, that takes a little bit of time in itself. So. Um, take a moment here, look at the source. We're going to see this again and again because what I'm going to show you is the source and then I'm going to show you the field notes that we have the students uh, to analyze the source. So take a, I'm going to give you 60 seconds to just like really take this in and then I'm going to show you the bibliographic information. Okay, so here now I've added a description. Um, sometimes when you go to the Library of Congress you don't really get any notes about the source that you are working with but um, luckily, this one does, and it's so rich here, and it explains so much about what contrabands is and what's happening in the image. Um, it takes away some of the processing for students, but I think that's okay when there's, you know, when you're doing gallery work and there's 10 to look at, it's okay, but, you know, if this shortcuts some of their having to, like, really dig deeper, I think they can still process, and there's a lot to sort of summarize, um, even with this, like, heads up um, text that they get. So take a moment here to read uh, this uh, bibliographic notes. Yes, the majority of the sources that are in this lesson are from the Library of Congress. Is there a one super archive for them? No, but if you visit um, our website, we have some links that we recommend that would help to um, sort of shortcut that process for you. And yes, Kimberly is absolutely right. The Library of Congress is uh, teacher section is really great and there's tons of lessons that already have 
um, collections of primary sources attached to them. Okay, so my assumption is that we're all fast readers. So, and you'll see the bibliographic notes are possible are available on each slide, subsequent slide as well. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a quiet moment to read it for yourself. So here we go. So I showed you this, uh, the primary source, and here is their fact-finding mission field notes. Again, we call it a fact-finding mission because we set it up so that we said, hey, everyone says, you know, Lincoln freed the slaves and the Emancipation Proclamation did all these wonderful things, but what did actually happen on the ground? What was going on? And so they're on a fact-finding mission, you know, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what was this, what were the sequence of events that brought about the Emancipation Proclamation? Um, and that forced uh, Lincoln's hand. What you'll see here is that um, the one of the key things about our fact finding mission field notes is that we always include um, a the lesson focus question at the top. Um, so the students are always primed and remember that there's a purpose for why they're looking at a primary source. Like this is connected to this larger question, this inquiry that they're engaged upon. Um, and um, the rest of the document is basic sourcing materials, so they have to figure out what the citation is and looking at um, a description of the, the source, the, its purpose and its audience, message and argument, making connections um, for evidence because they will use this um, source to build a part of their argument to answer the focus question. And then, you know, very important, a, a final column for them to, um, you know, a parking lot for all the questions they may still have or it's stuff they're still curious about um, as a result of the source. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to break down each of these sections and we'll do it together in applying, um, analyzing uh, the primary source I showed you previously with each of these sections. So here we go. Um, for the first part, um, here is the uh, source again. I took out the bibliographic notes because it's not that important for the first part of it. Uh, the basic citation information, you know, the type of document. This is this is sort of a freebie for you all because I'm going to assume that you all are the GATE students, um, super super A plus folks. Um, you already know what type of document it is. It says that in this parentheses. Um, who created it? Uh, oh, actually, that was in. It's uh, the creator is actually unknown. When and where is the document from? Um, if we are to believe um, this source information, Fort Monroe, which is in Virginia. Okay, so I did this first part of you because I knew I knew some of this. But the next part, I'm going to put you all in a hook and want to have you process this together. So let's analyze this next part, June. That's a very good question. Now, um, seemingly not that important, correct? But it is because in the biographic notes for the source, it actually gives the measurements of 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 this um, of the stamp, um, and uh, it's almost like a, the size. I, I want to say it's like almost like the size of a Manila envelope. It's like longer than eight and a half by eleven, so it's a, a really sizable one. So this is this is that's good. Is it official stationery? You all are very smart people. I, you all didn't have questions I would have. Yes, I didn't think about what kind of stationery or what, what kind of envelope, and was it an official document? Very, very good points. And here I am just, I just, I breezed through that first part of it. Thank you, everyone. So every, it seems like everyone's consistent with the description of the source. How about the purpose and audience? And then I love your comment, Teresa, about, okay, what does this mean about the Fug Fugitive Slave Act? Does the union who controls Fort Monroe have to return slaves, or are they in violation of the Fugitive Slave Act? And does this Fugitive Slave Act still apply in Confederate, you know, uh, country? So looking at the audience, I think June's comment is very is is a is a is a good one. That clearly it's not going to be for the officers because it would be really inflammatory for the local folks. Correct. So there's so the purpose is to demonstrate this moment in time in which slaves are entering Fort Monroe. I love this understanding of who the audience is by thinking about who is not for right, who is not, who it is not created for. It shows that the masters have no control over their slaves, that slaves and no one has said anything about contrabanding yet. The language of contrabanding, like that, slaves understand what the concept of contrabanding is, right? Like there's 
there's this term that they're using, come back. Um, can't come back now, master. This child's contrabanding. Like this understanding of this concept of contrabanding is something that's like pervasive or um, common enough that folks are leaving for Fort Monroe. Okay, so now that we look at the purpose and the description of the source, let's move on to its message and its argument. What's the main idea? Given taking this all together, what what what's happening here in this source? And Janelle, your point about the Emancipation Proclamation is um, is 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 a valid one. Um, I think a lot of your students will ask that question, and um, they'll make a connection that the Emancipation Proclamation is issued on January first, eighteen sixty-three. But this um, stamp on the envelope was created in eighteen sixty-one. So they might have some questions about the timing of that. So the main idea, one of the main ideas is Southern planters are losing their labor force and that um, slaves have a method to free themselves from the, their owners. And they see Fort Moreau as a safe space. And Patricia says there's a historical prophecy. Oh, at le very least that, that what's happening on the ground in 1861 would lead to and have long-term effects for the purpose of the war, for Lincoln's understanding of the war and for the North and South's understanding of the war and its purpose, for sure. So every time we have our students look at a primary source, we also ask them to think about, okay, well, how does this source relate to the question about how the slaves gain their freedom? What, what can we tell? What information can we gain from this about that? How would, how would this source help to inform our understanding, how we could answer the question of how slaves gain their freedom? So yes, that many slaves took it upon themselves to achieve freedom. And then um, Kimberly asks, how much freedom did they gain, right, by taking the act? We'll, and we will talk about that later. And Teresa's point that the contraband, pra contraband practice was proof that freeing blacks could make a difference in the war, that's right. That would deal a blow to the Confederacy's um, manpower and their morale. By the end of the war, at the start of the war, there were four million enslaved. Um, by the end of the war, half a million had left their uh, farms and plantations. And almost 200,000 slaves and black freemen fought in the military for the Union. So the slaves made a choice, right? And the, that choice was happening on the ground in 1861. And so that's what we want students to, to gather from this. And in the collection, um, and here's a key, every single, uh, in the lesson that, um, that you'll receive. I, it, there's a link to the lesson at our website. Um, so there, um, in that lesson complete packet, there's a mission field notes key for every single primary source. So here's one for the, um, the contrabanding um, primary source. So um, slaves made the choice uh, to free themselves. Um, so here is a collection of the primary sources available uh, as part of um, this lesson. And we do have a convention speech from 1843. We have a petition for black service volunteers before the Emancipation Proclamation. We have eyewitness accounts, autobiographies, and journals about slaves leaving um, their uh, farms and plantations. We have arts. Uh, we have um, art and letters and a music hymn um, and music sheet to sort of uh, uh, build a body of evidence to showcase that, um, that the enslaved and freed blacks wanted freedom, acted on their own, and forced this issue of um, emancipation upon Lincoln and Congress. So uh, the fourth step here is it's our assessment for the lesson and the assessment replicates exactly what we were trying to teach the students. So the students have to write cause and effect statements and they also have to be able to put into a timeline the course of events from 1860 to the end of the Civil War. Now there are only two key, in particular, you'll note there are only two key things that were only made possible 
after the Emancipation Proclamation. This forces them to understand cause and effect, right? That there are out of these six categories, six choices, only two are made possible after a certain date. And that was made possible with the Emancipation Proclamation. And everything that happened before it indicates that it's its supporting role in the in the course of the Emancipation Proclamation being issued. Um, and then finally, it's, um, students will have to write three actions that saves to gain the freedom, just in case they didn't get it from everything else that um, from their primary source analysis. So this is the entirety of the lesson. And those were the two things that could only happen here, these two arrows, that could happen with uh, the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and I have here resources for you if you want to dig deeper. Uh, to learn more about the Civil War or this blueprint lesson or another blueprint lesson. I want to thank Tim very much for a wonderful presentation and for all the educators who joined us for this session. Good night.